So um, Wang Guowen was a Chinese American filmmaker, art historian, and collector. He was born in 1918 in Changshu, the Jiangsu province, the river town that he so lovingly portrayed in the 1948 short film, A Town on the Yangzi, which we had recommended uh, watching before today's discussion. So the one family of Yangshu, uh, of Changshu, had been very influential in late imperial China. Many from the family served as scholar officials. Over five generations, the family gathered a large collection of classical paintings, ink rubbings of calligraphy, and rare books. At a young age, Mr. Wen, who belonged to the first generation in the family to be born after the end of the Qing Empire, was chosen to be the heir to this collection. Mr. Wen came to the US in 1938 to study for a master's um, in engineering at Purdue University. Um, and then he um, later on entered University of Wisconsin-Madison to study painting. In the early 1940s, supported by the China Institute in America and the Harmon Foundation, he began a long career of filmmaking, making a large number of documentary and educational films covering topics related to Chinese art, society, and history. In 1948, he brought his family collection to the US where he had studied and worked for a decade. From then on, besides filmmaking, he dedicated himself to conserving and studying this collection before eventually donating most of them to museums in both the US and in China. So let me first show you a clip from um, the tongue, a tongue on the Yangzi um, made in 1948 on his last trip um, before uh, the PRC um, uh, to China. So I've queued it. I'll just show you. And this is the beginning um, of the film. This is my town, my old hometown. Here my ancestors lived and died. Though I was not born and brought up here, I feel the town within me wherever I am. To this and many other Chinese towns, present is past, and past is present. At the top of the hills, which rise from the very heart of the town, the mighty Yangtze River is seen as a silver lining dividing the sky and the earth. It has come thousands of miles down the gorges and plains, and now is about to flow into the open sea. Lakes, rivers, streams, all waters connected with the Yangtze flow through and by the town. Their waters are the very life of the people. People go and come to and from the neighboring fields and villages and towns on boats and rafts. They even travel from house to house on boats. There are streets of stone and brick. There are streets of water. They wash their clothes and household utensils in the same water where they wash rice and vegetables, and they wash within earshot of each other. This is the same water which enriches the fishermen's nets. And this is the same water which invites the buffalo swim. For the river is life. It takes everything in and it is made of many things. And it changes all the time. And it flows on. 
So the 10,000 Li on the Yangzi by Wang Hui um, that uh, began the film. So, so, you know, it was a slow pan, right, showing um, the, the painting that began the film was one of Mr. Wen's most prized collections, now donated to the MFA uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So in the clip, we see an effort to remediate, to enliven, um, sorry, to enliven the, the painting with film and to film with a painterly touch, connecting the two media across time through the medium of water and through a first person narrative voice from someone who was both the guardian of the painting and the maker of the film. Indeed, like water, the filmmaker was also moving between places, taking in all the life in his camera and carrying it with him. For a media historian like myself, um, Mr. Wen's guardianship of a late imperial art and book collection, his filmmaking and his uh, cross -Pacific, uh, Pacific crossings present a fascinating story of media and mediation. Paintings, ink rubbings, books, and cinema, they're all media objects. They have materiality, technology, and temporality. They organize social relations and signify different forms of cultural capital. Despite being fragile objects, they can circulate and bring together publics and communities as they circulate. More importantly, the meanings of these media objects and the kind of work they performed in the society are always changing. What is a painting? What is a photograph uh, uh, calligraphy? What are art and cinema? And what can they do to us and to our relations with others? I wonder how Mr. Wen would answer these questions. And I bet his answers would change through his life as social and political upheavals rocked the 20th century. And as he embarked on many crossings of the Pacific during the wartime and afterwards, very much a medium himself, always moving in between times, spaces, between paper and film, English and Chinese. So if the first clip is from Mr. Wen's hometown, then let me show you another clip, which is close to home, but in a different sense. This is a, a film made also around the same time, 1947, I'm sorry about the noise outside, called The East in the West. Sorry, it's in Chinese, not subtitled. 来美留学的外国人, 除了同州的加拿大南美以外, 中国人最多。差不多在四十八州各大学中，处处有中国学生。他们研究的课程，清清楚楚地反映出国内的需要。Chinese students populate many universities in the country, and they their studies fulfill the need of China. 中国需要大量的生产，所以工科变成了留学生最多的部分。Engineering is the most popular subject. 有的在獲得學位後,繼續的在研究院深造,同時擔任教導的責任,轉過來幫助美國的學生。They also serve as teaching assistants to help Chinese uh, American students.美國各工學院完美的設備,差不多全經過中國學生的使用。像在這期 machines in the Department of Engineering had all been used and perfected by Chinese students. 或者像在这个航空工程部的小风洞里试验一种飞机的模型，画图是工厂制造程序的第一步，所以每一个工程学生都要在画图室花去不少的时间。毕业以后，中国工程学生差不多全利用机会，在美国各厂家里实习。美国政府同实业界都尽量的帮助，像在奇异电气公司的涡轮厂里，中美两国实习工程师协同考察这架涡轮发动机的震动次数。so um so this this film actually also goes on to document 
um, China Institute in America and the help they give to um, overseas Chinese students. Um, and Mr. Wen was also very active in the Chinese American community and served as the president of the China Institute um, from 1982 to 1987. One of our panelists, Yan Chiu-jen, um, had studied uh, the China Institute and we'll hear more from him a bit later. So um, Mr. Wen's films, um, I just wanted to conclude by saying that Mr. Wen's films haven't been widely known um, and due to um, you know, issues of marginalization to which um, his work was subjected. First, Mr. Wen produced documentary and educational films in association with of cinema culture, but until recently had been marginalized in film studies. Second, um, even when uh, Mr. Wen participated in the making of well-known films, such as the Battle of China in um, Frank Capra's Why We Fight uh, wartime documentary series, he and other Asian and Asian American uh, participants were seldom, seldom credited. This film was considered and has been considered simply as a US military production under Capra's direction. Chinese American strategic participation in wartime filmmaking um, has been largely um, neglected. Um, and finally, um, since he, is a, he was a filmmaker of Chinese origin living in the US, he fell between the cracks, not considered a Chinese or an American filmmaker. So um, you know, he was lost to both film histories. Um, and this applies to transnational filmmakers, um, for example, um, you know, many um, trans people working transnationally, such as Esther Un um, and Anna Mei Wang, um, had been uh, not registered in national histories. So um, engaging with Mr. Wen's films then can, can help bring documentary and educational cinema to the center of media histories, as well as bringing Chinese and Chinese American histories into conversation. Um, and this film is organized um, exactly for, um, you know, with, with scholars from these areas to comment, um, to start thinking about um, how to approach these films. Um, so Jim, could you give us a very brief um, overview of the collection um, here and then um, we can uh, go to the panelists. Okay, thanks, Ying. And I'm going to just uh, share my screen first. So this, I'm going to give a just brief introduction of the, the Wang Gowen film collection in the CV Star East Asian Library. So first, you know, Wang Gowen film collection donated by Mr. Wen since 2014 consists of approximately 739 individual film elements, almost all 16 millimeter, dating from 1944 to 1980s. And these films including in the collections are a wide variety of different types of film elements, including original film, master picture, and the sound elements, projection prints, work prints, chimps, and arts. This is certainly the most complete collection of Wen's films works in the containing master and original masters from many of his films. And his film, including the four major series, one is the Land of China series, mostly all filmed in the 1958 and finally released during the early 50s and the five big cities in China. And second was Out of China and the Crafts of China series, 1947 to 1991. Then number three is the Su Ming Li series of traditional Chinese arts and the crafts. And this is a sponsored by a Chinese American banker, Su Ming Li. So these are all the, uh, the historical Chinese uh, art and uh, crafts. The number four, the last series, the China history series. And it's a China enduring heritage. It's a 13 this uh, video disc, disc you know, uh, it's from 1963 to 1980. And our films, including his uh, uh, documentaries, 1971 to 1980, such as the uh, Expo 70 film, uh, Expo 70s in uh, uh, Osaka. And as Ying also mentioned, there are some collection uh, uh, in the collections Mr. Wen's involved as translator, consultant, distributor, such as the propaganda films sponsored by the US government and the United Nations during the World War II and aftermaths, like a Battle of China, Defense of Peace. And also during the 40s, there are two uh, very important companies founded by Mr. Wen. One is the China 
photographic equipment supply company. The second one is the China Film Enterprise of America Incorporate. And we just before this movie, uh, this event started just hours, just hours ago, we received these two special images. It's going to, we're going to talk about this more later. And the one on the right side, it's the logo of the, um, the China, uh, uh, China Cinema Enterprise of America. It's uh, designed by a famous Chinese artist, Ye Qian Yu. And you can see that it's all this uh, very interesting feature. This is the Phoenix, this is the Qi Ling, it's a kind of all the fortune you know, uh, figures. And this is the fish. And on the right, on the left side, this again, it's the special uh, congr congratulation notes by the one of the most famous Chinese writers, Lao Shi. And I try to translate a little bit thing here. So he said, brothers, the movie stars shining on you for building a Chinese Hollywood. And this is a very interesting. And this is done by Lao Shi in 1948. Uh, May in New York City. So we will dis discuss more about this one later. So the next one, finally, so uh, those collection films, uh, oh, this go back, it's right here. So then in the 2019, and we received a special Mellon grant funding to digitize uh, uh, 21,000 items, we call it AMIs, audio moving images collections, that including including the 112 doc, uh, documentary films and the related uh, footages from Van Gogh films. This is selected by our uh, audiovisual you know, um, library. So these are all digitized. It's a streaming ready in the Columbia's digital library collection, uh, the websites. So uh, my introduction is right, stop right here. Okay, thank you so much, Jim. Um, so now um, I want to introduce our first panelist, uh, Yan Chiu Zhen. Um, Yan Chiu Zhen is Assistant Professor of Chinese History at Misericordia University. Um, his research centers on the politics of intercultural encounters. He is revising his first book manuscript on the history of Chinese cultural diplomacy in the United States in the 20th century. Um, he's also developing another project on the changing meanings of Chinese food among, uh, chi chi among China's, um, sorry, among China's fundamental transformations in the 20th century. So um, Yan Jie, I pass on to you. Okay, and uh, thanks again uh, to Ying and uh, Jim, and of course to the uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the CV Star East Asian Library for inviting me to this uh, wonderful panel. And uh, uh, I am really glad to have the opportunity to share with the audience wherever you are in the world uh, about uh, some episodes from uh, uh, Mr. Wong's life as seen in my research, both the archival uh, research but, and also the uh, oral history uh, interviews. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, talk about some of the things I can see uh, in uh, his uh, remarkable life. And particularly, I really want to emphasize uh, uh, the capacious uh, meanings of being Chinese, as we can see in his career. And uh, uh, one of the first things I want to talk about here is, as you have just heard from me, um, Mr. Wong basically changed his uh, career pattern from an engineering student to a celebrated uh, uh, educational uh, cinematographer. So those in the audience, if you're thinking about changing your career, this is a, a historical precedent. But why did he change his mind in the uh, 30s and 40s after he came to the US? According to my conversation with him, uh, Mr. Wong, uh, although was, uh, he was an engineering student studying from college at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, his calling was elsewhere. And uh, he was struggling to combine what he was doing and he really, what he really wanted to do. And thanks to the suggestions from uh, two other very important figure, uh, figures in modern Chinese history. One is Hu Shi. I don't think uh, this figure needs uh, uh, too much introduction here. And the other one happened to be the long-term director of the China Institute in America. And his name uh, was Meng Zhi. And uh, their suggestion was, you already have the engineering know-how and you also have your uh, real interest in Chinese art and history. 
why don't you combine those two by uh, uh, making educational uh, films on these subjects? And uh, where did uh, Mr. Wong, uh, Mr. Wong get his uh, initial training? It is through the introduction of uh, Hu and Meng. He uh, was trained at uh, the Harmon Foundation, which was better known as a major supporter of African American art in the 1930s and 1940s. And here, I think we see another story of uh, uh, the racial solidarity between uh, Chinese and African Americans. And this is not necessarily a new story per se, but rather the existing account has been focusing on the uh, African American radical left, such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson. And I think here we have another episode. And uh, uh, Charlotte, of course, is uh, the expert on these subjects, and I will let her talk more about these. And uh, through the, uh, uh, the career in educational film, we can really see other important connections in uh, uh, Mr. Wong's life. And here I will give you two examples. And the first one here is the famous modern Chinese painter by the name of uh, Zhang Shuqi. And uh, according to my research, this 1943-1944 uh, 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 documentary called Out of a Chinese Painting Brush probably is one of the earliest uh, works by uh, Mr. Wong in educational film. And I do not think this one was in the, uh, uh, I don't think this one is in the Columbia connection, uh, collection. I found it at the, uh, Hoover Institution Archives a few years ago. And uh, uh, Zhang Shuqi uh, was, um, as I said, modern Chinese painter. And uh, uh, he came to the US in the 40s as uh, the so-called artistic ambassador to uh, raise awareness of China's wartime plight and also seeking more uh, American aid. And one of his famous works was, uh, uh, let me see, A Messenger of Peace and also known as 100 Doves. And uh, you can still find that at the uh, Fr uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, Presidential Library in uh, New York. And uh, Mr. Wong happened to be one of the first who actually documented uh, Zhang's uh, painting uh, uh, techniques and uh, in the educational uh, uh, film. And uh, as to whether uh, Mr. Zhang, uh, the painter here, uh, to what extent he was still the Chinese painter, because uh, some of his uh, brushwork was uh, uh, clearly informed by his training in Western painting techniques, and also this kind of public spectatorship of his uh, uh, work. Uh, to what extent was that Chinese? I think that's uh, something we can further discuss here. And uh, uh, this is the first important connection uh, I want to share with you through uh, Mr. Wong's work. And the second example, I want to uh, share with the audience here is uh, another uh, figure uh, by the name of uh, Situ Huimin. And Situ Huimin basically was uh, uh, a left-wing cinematographer already active in the Shanghai film circle in the 1930s. And as you can see, he was already involved in a, a major film, such as this one, uh, Chinese name uh, Tao Li Jie, so Plunder uh, Peach and Plum in 1934, about the uh, plight for uh, uh, educated uh, uh, Chinese uh, after their graduation from school. And uh, Su Huiming's name uh, is listed here. And in the late 1940s, uh, Situ came to the U.S. and uh, he worked briefly for this company called uh, China Film uh, Enterprises of America. And if you found that uh, uh, familiar, it is because that's exactly one of the uh, uh, companies uh, by Mr. Wong. But uh, uh, Mr. Wong in the late uh, 40s did not necessarily know about Situ's uh, uh, political orientation and his affiliation also with uh, uh, the Communist Party. And uh, you can see uh, Situ, after uh, coming to the U.S. and joining uh, Mr. Wong's company, was also involved in some of the uh, uh, major productions here. And uh, this one on the left, you can see uh, two Chinese dancers, uh, Chinese folk dancers actually featuring the uh, uh, famous Chinese dancer Dai Lian, who was born in uh, Trinidad. 
And uh, you can see Sidhu Huimings here, uh, Sidhu Huimings name listed here as the, uh, 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 the advisor for uh, photography and also editing. And uh, very quickly after that, Si Huiming uh, left for China and uh, uh, Mr. Wong did not uh, talk to him again, basically three decades later. After the reform and opening up, uh, Si Huiming became the vice minister of culture uh, uh, in the People's Republic. And uh, uh, one of the uh, foreign guests he uh, uh, helped was Mr. Wong when he returned to China to uh, uh, take photographs of uh, the Palace Museum collections in Beijing, which culminated in his uh, 1982 uh, uh, book, which is actually one of the first on the uh, uh, Palace Museum collections uh, uh, in the West after 1949. So you can really see these uh, trans-Pacific uh, uh, connections through uh, Mr. Wong's uh, wonderful uh, uh, career. And uh, uh, of course, China Institute, if you still remember, that was uh, the institute that got him uh, uh, into the uh, career of uh, educational film. So uh, I just want to conclude by uh, saying uh, uh, some brief things about the history of uh, the China Institute and uh, uh, Mr. Wang's uh, involvement in there. And uh, uh, this institute was founded in 1926, so uh, exactly 95 years ago. And uh, um, in a nutshell, I would say that this is the organization uh, founded by cosmopolitan Chinese and uh, also Americans. And uh, uh, um, the founding director was uh, 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 Guo Binglen, who was, uh, uh, the, uh, who was the uh, president of the National Southeast University before this post. And uh, one of the panelists today, uh, Carolyn, uh, um, was, uh, is actually a descendant of uh, Guo Binglen. So we can we can hear more about that from uh, Carolyn too. And uh, uh, this organization, China Institute, uh, was promoting Chinese cultural diplomacy. So their message was really uh, uh, China's cultural refinement against the uh, uh, common understanding of China as a racial or even ideological other. And uh, Mr. Wong, of course, got uh, his career advice through the long-term director of the China Institute. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, one of the series in the uh, Columbia Film Collection, China, the Enduring Heritage, he actually uh, made it for uh, the China Institute. And uh, uh, finally, in the uh, 1980s, he became the president and also uh, uh, presided over uh, its 60th uh, anniversary. So uh, I think I would just uh, stop here, but once again, I think the larger message here is really uh, the, uh, uh, the trans-Pacific uh, connections and also the uh, uh, broader meaning of being Chinese beyond the, uh, uh, the narrow nationalist lens. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Yan Xiu. Um, so I'll introduce our next panel, uh, panelist. Um, Charlotte Brooks um, is a professor of history at Baruch College, CUNY. Um, she is a historian of the 20th century United States and of the Chinese diaspora. Her scholarship spans numerous fields, including immigration, race, Asian American history, politics, and urban history. She is the author of numerous articles and three books, um, American Exodus, Second Generation Chinese Americans in China, uh, 1901 to 19, uh, 1949, um, uh, which came out uh, 2019, Between Mao and McCarthy, um, Chinese American Politics in the Cold War Years, um, uh, 2015, um, and Alien Neighbors, Foreign Friends, Asian Americans, Housing and the Transformation of Urban California, uh, which came out to, uh, 2009. Um, so Charlotte, I'll pass it to you. Thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and to try to put Wang Go Wang into context in mid-century America, um, both in terms of his filmmaking and cultural production, but also as a Chinese American of that era. 
So Mr. Wong arrived in the United States for the first time in August of 1938. Um, he sailed from Shanghai, a war-torn city, divided between foreign and Japanese-controlled areas on the Canadian Pacific liner Empress of Asia. Um, and according to the China Press, the English language newspaper published in Shanghai, the ship's passengers included a number of notable people, a Portuguese vice consul, a Havas wire service correspondent, and an employee of the major China-based American firm Anderson and Meyer. The paper did not mention the handful of students aboard, including uh, Xing Cheng Wang and his friend Xu Li. And of course, this is... Um, Xu Li is a friend of the person we, we talk about in this as uh, Wang Go Wang. Um, pictured here at, in his Purdue University yearbook. Uh, both, of the, both of the young men were headed to Purdue University to study engineering. Uh, after graduation, they remained friends actually, um, and they moved to Brooklyn. Uh, and in those days, um, right in about 1940-41, Xu Li was the one who was actually working at the China Institute while uh, Wang Ge Wang had just quit his job as an engineer to study film at the Harmon Institute. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, of course, Wang had completely thrown himself into uh, filmmaking and film work. Uh, interestingly, Xu, Xu Li actually moved up to Schenectady, New York to work as an engineer for General Electric. So he kind of went back to, fil uh, to engineering. Now, details like those remind us of how larger events and upheavals can really dramatically transform the plans that people make for their own lives. Uh, Wang Ge Wang experienced this numerous times. The Sino-Japanese War that began in 1937 prompted him to study in the U.S., leaving, of course, in 1938 um, to come to the U.S. The United States' own entry into World War II against Japan in 1941 helped Wang Ge find employment in the film industry, introduced him to his future wife, um, pictured here in her own college yearbook uh, on the lower left-hand corner. And the Civil War in China led both to eventually make the United States their permanent home and to become what neither likely imagined when they first set sail for the United States in the late 30s and early 40s. In other words, at some point in this process, they became Chinese Americans, not something either of them probably ever imagined they would do at the outset. Now, many of these same events transformed what it meant to be a Chinese American at the time that uh, the Wongs started to become Chinese American. Uh, Chinese began coming to the United States in significant numbers in the mid 19th century. Um, in the Western part of the US especially, they encountered violent, prolonged and politically well-organized white racism, which was most concretely expressed in the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, and that law prohibited the further immigration of Chinese laborers, reiterated that Chinese could not naturalize as citizens, uh, and allowed in only a few categories of Chinese, such as students and merchants. Unlawful immigration from China continued for decades, meaning that much of the Chinese community in America in Chinatowns like this one, which is a picture of San Francisco's Chinatown from around the turn of the century. But much of the Chinese community in America from the 1880s onward to long past the 1940s consisted of vulnerable people without valid legal status uh, in the eyes of the immigration service. Now, whether immigrants or native born people of Chinese ancestry who because of their birth on US soil were American citizens, Chinese Americans during the 61 years uh, of Chinese exclusion were largely working class people, almost all of whom traced their origins to a few regions of Guangdong province's Pro River Delta. Most sought jobs in the handful of economic niches that they had carved out uh, often simply to avoid white competition and hostility, such as hand laundries and chop suey restaurants. Uh, these Chinese American laborers and workers had little chance of upward mobility in American society. And in fact, close to half of the US born Chinese American citizens in the early 20th century actually migrated to China for better lives and opportunities than they could imagine having in the United States. Now, China born students whose numbers began to grow 
by about 1910 were distinctive from working class, socially marginalized Chinese Americans. Known in China as returned students, Liu Shuishan, they formed a self-consciously elite group who viewed the modernization of China as their special burden and task. A good number of these students from China in the years that I'm talking about, really 1910 to about 1940, uh, 1945, a good number of them came from Guangdong, especially in the early years of the 20th century, but increasingly the bulk of Chinese students hailed from Central and North China. Um, often they had attend Western founded or Western influenced um, primary and secondary schools and colleges, and they mostly came from generally well-to-do and often from elite families. Wang Guang was part of this group of Chinese students. He arrived in the United States in the last years of exclusion, which Congress finally repealed in 1943 uh, in a gesture to wartime ally China. Congress's decision actually did almost nothing, really nothing at all, for America's unlawful entrance from China, who dared not expose themselves. But the repeal of exclusion did create a tiny token quota of 105 Chinese immigrants a year and finally allowed for the naturalization of Chinese uh, in the United States. Uh, and this event, the event that transformed the Wang's lives even more, the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War, also prompted even more changes to U.S. immigration law. In 1953, the Wongs became beneficiaries of the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, which enabled them to legally remain in the United States. They were also included in the 105 person annual quota for China of immigrants. And about half of that quota was used for refugees and displaced persons like they were uh, displaced persons. Uh, and what happened was that that meant that half of the quota was actually mortgaged long into the future to allow in some displaced persons from China. So the Wongs settled down to a permanent life in America at a moment when the US was becoming ever more focused um, on strategic, economic, and military ties to the Asia Pacific. So this new American life for people like the Wangs and other what were known as stranded students and stranded professionals who regularized their status to stay in the United States after 1950 was far from uncomplicated. Uh, the historian Madeline Sue has argued that in the late 1940s and definitely in the 1950s, the US government viewed people like the Wangs as quote, welcome and valued immigrants with shared political and economic values, whose limited numbers and symbolic value and the war on communism enabled not only the uh, warm reception of readily assemblable educated new immigrants, but also redemption for resident Chinese Americans, unquote. In other words, to, con to concerned US officials during the early Cold War years, the Wongs and other so-called stranded students and stranded professionals from China were distinct from the working class Chinese Americans of the past. And the newcomers in particular had significant symbolic value to the United States as the US attempted to both earn the trust of newly independent Asian nations and downplay the way racial injustice and segregation, uh, particularly Jim Crow in the, in the US South and the disfranchisement of black voters there deeply shaped American life and undercut US pronouncements about equality and freedom. These same contradictions shaped the lives of educated Chinese like the Wongs, however. Their education, legal status, and English fluency often enabled people like them to find professional positions and to become US citizens, even as working class Chinese who had entered the country unlawfully before 1950 continued to work mainly in low wage service industries and beginning in 1956, faced a nationwide immigration crackdown that made many of them stateless people. At the same time though, elite Chinese immigrants like the Wangs often grappled with the same kind of basic racism as their working class Chinese American counterparts, unable because of their race to find developers or realtors who would sell them homes in many neighborhoods, unable to climb above a certain level in many professions because of racism and often uh, grappling with deep misunderstandings of who they were and what they represented. Coming from different backgrounds than the Chinese American majority, speaking different Chinese dialects, living in different economic universes, many of the new arrivals may have agreed with the assessment that 
in the eyes of US government, at least, they were a new kind of Chinese American. But there was a reason that Wang Go Wang spent much of his life in America as a sort of back and forth explainer and translator of Chinese and American culture. Certainly, he arrived in America right at the dawn of a period in which so many foundations, studios, and publications sought services like that. This is a moment when the US turned toward Asia more than ever before, economically, culturally, strategically, and militarily. But Wong also arrived in an America steeped in longtime attitudes about the supposed yellow peril, the exotic, inscrutable, unknowable, and potentially dangerous Chinese. He saw these pernicious ideas play out again and again in the immigration raids, in the tight immigration quotas that did not loosen until 1965, and in the regular misperceptions of China, Chinese, and Chinese Americans, misperceptions that obviously persist down to our current day. Thank you so much, Charlotte. This is wonderful. And all the photos and the, the records that you found. Um, yeah, um, so, so our next speaker uh, is Professor Jane Gaines, um, professor of film at Columbia University and the author of Contested Culture, The Image, The Voice and the Law, 1991, Fire and Desire, Mixed uh, Race, uh, movies in the silence era 2001 and pink slipped what happened to women in the early um, film industries um, 2018 um, jane is a founder of the visible evidence Conf uh, conference on documentary um, and has written many articles on documentary theory um, and radicalism feminism and film, early cinema, critical race theory, and intellectual property and piracies. Um, so Jane, pass it on to you. So thank you, Aang. Thank you, Jim Chang, uh, colleagues at Columbia. And historians of Chinese culture and Chinese American culture who teach us so much around this collection. And my particular area, what's most exciting is because I do early cinema, the first decade, the first two decades, working with visiting Chinese PhD students from Peking University, Beijing Normal University, and discovering the legacy in New York of the Green Wall Company, which was started by overseas Chinese in 1921. So in Brooklyn between 1921 and 1924 was an, a, a company Basically, this is a student-run company, um, a company that imagines China as having its own industry. And in 1924, these students moved to Shanghai and become part of the extremely important moment in Shanghai when there were as many as 150 companies. And this is the golden age that many of us who do world cinema return to again and again and yearn to have open up more and more to those of us who do comparative world film studies. So thinking about Chinese Americans, thinking certainly about Marini Wong, Ying Cheng mentioned, who made work in 1916. She had one film, Curse of the Kuang Guang, she made with family money in Oakland, California. Following her, Esther Ang who also was part of the group of Chinese, um, how should we put it, entrepreneurs who around Chinatown in San Francisco imagined deep links to the home country. So I've known for some time about these particular Chinese Americans, but then I discovered today, Mr. Wang in 1940 had two companies that were imagining the same kind of film production. So clearly we have a lot of work to do to link up this legacy that gets longer and deeper. But let me back up to say my particular area of expertise includes motion picture film technology. And this is why um, Mr. Wang is so extremely important as someone trained as an engineer, and an artist, and what I'm going to talk about is film stock, because his particular collection, uh, I've discovered in looking closely at it, is this micro lesson in the evolution of a terribly important form that he would have been special in realizing had enormous potential. When Jim Chang told me about this collection, and he said, 
it's around the 40s and the 50s, it's educational film. I imagine black and white because that was the major way educational films were made, sold in the US in bulk. These were shorts, most of them made by a company called Encyclopedia Britannica. And as a student in the American public school system, we saw many of those 16 millimeter films projected on either a Bell and Howell or Kodak pageant projector. And the school districts owned them. This was a thriving business. And I imagined that type of film, but I was wrong. In the 112 items I'm gonna show you from the collection scanned by the CV Star Library, the majority of the titles are shot in Kodachrome. And here's where any historian of the photochemical, photochemical phenomenon would just have this ex eerie experience of looking at titles that begin as early as 1940. Now, let me explain why this is important, why it's so amazing to me. Kodachrome, developed by the Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York, from an experiment made beginning in 1913 by a couple of um, young men and taken over and named Kodachrome, perfected, and then made commercial. It's 1935 that it's first sold. So five years after the development and the merch, you could say the marketing of this very early phenomenon, he's already starting to use it. And I think the next phase of research I'm interested in on this collection is, was he shooting the two examples I'm gonna first look at, Chinese firecrackers from 1940 and footage shot over Yellowstone and Grand Canyon National Park. So I want you to look here at the range of titles. Thinking first, oh, these are mm, content-based. This is about bronzes. This is about folk dancing. And it's about cultural specificity. And I immediately begin thinking, well, let's just look at Chinese firecrackers and say, well, it's 1940. What's it going to show me about the evolution of Technicolor as a photochemical phenomenon? So first, what you're going to see in 16 millimeter scanned film is you're going to see um, what we call China marker over leader. You may say, oh, this is uh, whatever you know, this should be cut off. No, this is terribly important. China marker was what you actually wrote on the celluloid with. So this leader is a little bit long. It, it leader is either black or white. So this is both black and white. And then what comes up for me most interesting is the shade of red of the title. The title is a little bit orange. Here it is, Chinese firecrackers. A little bit of an orange red, almost a Chinese red, but not a technicolor Red, red, what we say when we refer to the Technicolor uh, range of palette is that Technicolor is highly saturated. And this has a little more orange than you would imagine Technicolor is having. So it's Kodachrome. It's anyone who knows this industry knows this is Kodachrome. But there's something about the blues that are slightly blue green. The reds that are, it's a Chinese red, but not a Technicolor red. And when I start to look at the slightly dark, and then I'm just having you look at, there we go, the blue in the background. Is this gray or blue? It's a blue gray that you get with Technicolor. It's indoors. Uh, which means there's a lot of light required to even expose the image. Finally, the bamboo core is removed. And the... Now you're also going to say, well, this is voiceover. Most of these titles were shot non-sync. Voiceover put in later, but that's telling me that he's actually, uh, he's quite economical. He doesn't need to have sync sound. So what else can we tell we about the color? This wonderful red, the same tone of red. And here's this wonderful blue, blue gray. Contrast with the dark, the red, 
the blue gray, this, this is what Kodachrome could do, shot inside, low light level, close-ups, and no exterior shooting. Let me get back to where we were here. So the fascination in going through these titles is what topics? Uh, is this illustrated lectures? Is this Chinese history? And we already know from Jim, the overview of the kinds of series he featured, a lot of objects, art objects, um, a lot of demonstration of activity. And you could say in the tradition, the John Grierson tradition of taking a camera and watching peasant people, watching in an anthropological way, he has a lot of this within his collection. But I wanna show you next another 1940 film because I'm just concentrating here, not on the later, but the amazing work done as early as 1981. And this, um, 1940, this number 81 is the two national parks. What I want you to think about here is in the national park footage, he has sky only. Uh, now this is the artist in him. Why is he so fascinated with just the sky? Well, one of the dilemmas is Kodachrome was very slow. What we mean by slow is the speed. We say slow speed, that means the sensitivity to light. It had an ASA, it's American Standards Association rating of 10, which means it was extremely slow. You had to bring in a great deal of extra light as you saw in Chinese firecrackers and their making. And, and you didn't even get illumination evenly. The dark areas are very, very dark. So look at what happens when he's shooting against the sky. The daytime looks like evening. So let, let's look at the sky only. This is fascination with sky. So this is, again, our wonderful gray tone and a kind of pinkish effect. Now you're going to say, well, it doesn't look like it's quite in focus. I'm not worried about the lens focus here. I'm interested in the color. And it could be that he's doing a kind of experiment in the, in the color. Fascinated with the sun is setting. But for a sunset, this is amazing. He's getting an image on this stock, which is so sensitive, um, not, not, not fast enough. Sensitive, but not fast enough. And here we have, um, again, the fascination with why he's shooting when the sun is almost, almost gone to get the contrast between that orange and the fascination that, that he must be having with the not quite blue of the sky. So that gives us a good example. Now, what I want to say, getting to the very end here, I'm gonna give my other example, oh, that's number five, here we go, is I'm fascinated with what Charlotte is pointing out here relative to the cultural implications of this work. This is To Be Me, one of my favorites in the collection, and To Be Me is a short film about a Chinese American, no arrival, not yet even a Chinese American boy, a boy of maybe 10 who's learning English, but in his voiceover, he's mastered enough English to explain how he's interacting with his community, learning what to do in his school and to revere Chinese tradition. So I'm gonna just show you a little bit of To Be Me because I think we need an entire seminar on this film. So the, the boy is narrating, this is 1973. So the use of Kodogram goes all the way to 1973. And the, the implications of to be me, who is me, who am I, what is my cultural heritage? How can I explain myself and my adventure, my self-discovery? That's, by the way, a wonderful shot. Uh, pan right without cutting. The to 
boys fishing. He is fascinated with water, so here they are. I'm Tony from Hong Kong. About a year and a half ago, my family moved to America. I was excited. At first, we lived at my aunt's house, and then we moved to the Chinatown. Then, about one, maybe two days later, I went to Castle School. But the first day of school over here was bad. I was scared. Like, uh, the first time I went to the room, I was scared. What's fascinating to me is that he's using this tracking shot in the classroom to suggest the point of view of the child and this wonderful superimposition from the child's face to the child's classroom. Uh, it, it could be, we, we can talk about uh, Wang Wang's work is a kind of masterpiece, minor masterpieces these are when one studies them from the point of view of motion picture film form, but also technology as it evolved in this period from 1940 to 1980. So let me say in closing that there's a way in which this color, uh, you could say nostalgia, color nostalgia has significance for those of us who saw a lot of Kodachrome from the time Queen Elizabeth I was coronated in 1953. 16 millimeter films made of her coronation were all in Kodachrome. So there are these American events that for many of us, um, we imagine in Kodachrome. And for Kim to use that aesthetic and explore, I believe that he's exploring the possibilities of that Kodachrome aesthetic in these particular films, but to use them in his hometown on the Yangtze, but then to also use them in giving us the, the background of life, ordinary life, that's not so ordinary because this is a young uh, Chinese person becoming a Chinese American within this short. So Wen Wing's art collection was donated to the Museum of Modern Art in Boston, as we've just learned. Also parts of his family treasures, treasure collection, uh, the artifact collection is so important and uh, significant in Chinese architectural and art history, went to the Shanghai Museum. And these are rare objects, but these films are not just records, in many cases, because this is Chinese culture, of art objects. These are treasures in their own right for different reasons. The CV Star Library collection looks forward to a future of cultural value, cultural value in the history of technological imaging. So in closing, let me also say why it's so important that today is only the first of a series of colloquia devoted to Wang O Wang's work as a filmmaker, a film producer, a, a cinematographer in his own right. His life as well as his work opens us onto his contributions in addition to the Chinese American community, his film work um, dedicated as it was to the transnational connection and cultural confluence that's so central to our areas of study at Columbia. We yes could devote an entire symposium to just that short documentary about young Chinese immigrant Tony Guang and his discovery of a new home. And in 1973, it's interesting, I looked to this the credits of the film to find that it was funded by none other than the US Office of Education. So this brings us right back to the current moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jing. And um, this is a wonderful tour through some of our collections and, and noticing the color is really amazing. Um, next, I want to introduce um, Eugenia Ling, um, Professor of Chinese History and Director of the Weatherhead Institute. Um, initially, um, I asked Eugenia to open the, um, the round table um, to introduce the round table.
table. Um, but then I thought uh, it will be good for, for her to also have a chance to listen to other panelists and then to respond um, from her specialties. So uh, Eugenia researches on a wide range of topics in late imperial and modern Chinese history, with a particular focus on the history of science and industry, mass media, consumer culture, affect studies and gender, as well as law and urban society. Um, she is the author of public passions, the trial of Shi Jianqiao, and the rise of popular sympathy in Republican China um, uh, coming out uh, to 2007, 2007, and uh, vernacular industrialism in China, local innovation and translated technologies in the making of a cosmetic Cosmetics Empire, 1900 to 19, for, uh, 1940, uh, which came out last year. Um, so Eugenia. Yeah, thank you, Ying. Um, I wanted to uh, thank um, my, uh, first of all, Ying and Jim for organizing such a fabulous event. And um, and I'll speak a little bit more about uh, Jim and his contribution to uh, Columbia's um, collections, the library, Star Library, but just the library collections uh, uh, in general in a bit. Uh, but you know, Jim, this is such a fantastic collection that uh, you've you're you're helping us, uh, you know, digitize and and collect. And um, I wanted to also thank uh, Jane Yenchu and Charlotte. Uh, this was really a fabulous panel um, that was um, so inspiring. Um, I mean, obviously, we have such a fascinating figure uh, who produced these wonderful films to uh, work, um, you know, to, to be inspired from and to, to, to spur uh, my, my colleagues, my uh, imagination and expertise uh, so that they can give us these, they were short, but they were just really well packed and powerful talks. Um, Ying asked me to just to give a few general comments or responses. And this is, you know, so this is just really totally off the cuff. Um, so it certainly is nothing, uh, not gonna be nearly as sophisticated as some of the, what my colleagues have just done. But I, I wanted to say that I found the entire panel um, event so far extremely moving, um, particularly given uh, our contemporary moment. And I think many of my co-panelists have already alluded to this. Uh, immigration is uh, such a fraught issue. Sino-American relations is at a nadir. And just, you know, very upsettingly, the recent waves of anti-Asian violence, uh, both on the streets in Chinatown, we saw an image of Chinatown in Charlotte's, um, uh, uh, you know, slideshow. Uh, you know, we are seeing, you know, similar just images from, you know, old, of old elderly Chinese in Chinatown being shoved. Uh, and and uh, you know violent acts committed against them, but also in in our own communities that are supposed to be protected, right? Um, I think we are all suffering on our campus because a lot of Chinese students can't come and join us. Um, Asian and Asian American scientists are being targeted. Um, so it, all of these, uh, for all of these reasons, I find this panel. Um, extremely important and the fact that we can have and celebrate and, and also um, uh, collect and, and celebrate the legacy and, and maintain the legacy of somebody like uh, Wen Lingu is very, very important. Um, and uh, precisely because of what uh, so many of you have brought up, uh, you know, he was such an interesting uh, figure, a cultural diplomat was used, an ambassador for China um, but in addition to that, I mean, and that's obvious, right? Uh, you know, he's sitting here uh, producing these wonderful films that Jane just did a fantastic, I mean, just the, the sort of idea of the nostalgia of color, right, for us, uh, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s in America, I was I was too, and, and really having those kind of memories, but then having it put in, in this context of an Asian American filmmaker who's telling a very different story um, from the films that I have in my memory that, that are saturated with that Kodachrome. So, so that was a really kind of a powerful um, uh, narration that Jane gave us and really made me think about uh, the other, the lurking issue that is in, or not, or not so lurking in both Yenchu and Charlotte's um, um, comments about um, his identity, right? Um, it's, it's I love the, the terms stranded, he's uh, stateless, he's displaced. Um, um, and Liu uh, Xuesheng, the very concept of Liu, right? And that was in Ying's introductory, off the cuff introductory remarks that were so beautiful as well, right? Um, and, and this idea of flowing and movement, right? Um, 
himself being a, a medium and, and uh, a tr uh, someone who mediates two cultures, uh, translates, uh, his English is be utterly beautiful, his Chinese, of course, right? <laughs> I mean, such a learned Chinese man. Uh, and then he himself as a polymath in so many ways, right? So he's not only a polyglot, he's a polymath, someone who, who can um, transcend occupational spheres and areas of expertise. Coming here, as many Chinese did under the China, China Institute, as Yen Chiu brought, right? China Institute was so important in bringing during the war, I just read a manuscript on this, right? Wartime industry in China uh, was built with US aid. And the China Institute played a really important role in mobilizing these talented Chinese um, students uh, in the sciences, bringing them here, placing them into, you know, General Electric, into, you know, the chemistry, <laughs> uh, pharmaceutical companies, giving them training um, on the ground, right, as well as in the universities. And this is all meant for them to go back to help build the Chinese um, state during war. Um, and uh, so someone like, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, Wang Ge, when coming out of that context, right, you see that sense of patriotism that was so um, much part and parcel of that kind of wartime crucible that generated these intellectuals, these, these cosmopolitan wanderers who land um, on, on our shores in the US in order to build their country, right? And he was very much part of that, right? Um, and he had found his calling not to be engineering, which was a crucial component of that kind of um, rebuilding of China, but of filmmaking. And it was, a, it was and that, that's what was so wonderful to learn here uh, tonight and, and making educational films and documentary films in general and, and, and how powerful those films are, right? So watching something as beautiful as the 1948 Town of the Young, Youngs, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, you 1948, right? This is just right after the war. Um, and it's also, uh, as Yen Chiu told us, right when he became literally displaced, right? He became kind of the stranded professional uh, in the US because of the, dis, uh, uh, be because of um, the particular, uh, I can't remember what it was called, the Displaced Persons Act um, that um, uh, allowed him to stay as an immigrant here in the US. And, um, and I think that nostalgia, uh, the sense of love, his root. So he's displaced. He 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 flows. Um, he's stateless and he's stranded, and yet he's rooted, right? And and that being rooted in his jiaxiang in his town, um, that permeates that particular film. And it was just so loving, <laughs> and beautiful, and poetic. Um, and that brings me finally to Jane's shot of, or she shared with us to be me. Um, you know, years later, he had uh, no no longer was he so displaced. He had created a home in the in the U.S. He had his family. He was able to go back and forth between the U.S. and China. He became um, an extremely uh, uh, you know successful filmmaker at that point in time. A famous art collector who was also the director of the China Institute, not just a recipient of of China Institute help. Um, so by the 1970s, right, he is still making films and he uh, made this film To Be Me, which Jane just shared with us. And I thought it just kind of full circle, uh, some of the images, the fishing, right? Um, it, uh, the water, uh, it's, it's not, it looked like, I don't know, Jane, if you knew exactly what, it looked like, I don't know, Atlantic City or something. I'm not quite sure what it was. It wasn't quite the Yangtze. <laughs> it wasn't quite the fishing boats of his hometown Changshu, but it, the, the trope of fishing was something that was very important in his Yangtze film. Uh, and you see it again in this very uh, interesting film where he's not talking about, he's not recounting his boyhood. He's recounting the boyhood, uh, the, the immigration experience of young boys from Hong Kong. Um, but, and then the other shot was one that Jane, Jane that you showed us was one of uh, the boys uh, with trepidation entering the classroom. Um, and that brings to mind the engineering film uh, where he comes to America as a uh, young man but probably filled with trepidation entering the classrooms of Purdue. Um, although in that film, it was really fascinating because it was a little, just to sort of the alma mater, that was Columbia, right? The shot, <laughs> the first shot in the engineering film was from the steps of Low Library, right? It was a Columbia shot and was actually quite triumphant. Um, so, so anyways, it really, uh, this panel really came full circle, I thought, and, and just has done such a wonderful job of introducing a, a fabulous individual. Um, and I, I think uh, I'm gonna end there. I probably already took up a little bit too much time. And what I wanna do now is to um, 
uh, introduce uh, the uh, remaining participants uh, for uh, the last component of this uh, event. And uh, it's uh, going to be a round table. And uh, I'm extremely honored. Uh, we are all extremely honored and very excited to have two fabulous guests to join uh, Jim uh, for this final section. Uh, the first uh, is uh, uh, Wen Wenge's own daughter, Si Wen. Uh, and she herself uh, uh, was, I, I, if I understand you were born here, but you returned to China um, with your parents in 1948. Uh, although then you came back to the United States where you did uh, uh, your undergraduate studies uh, as well as medical school uh, in Boston. And uh, you yourself are extremely accomplished. You worked in, uh, Suwen worked in New Mexico as a physician uh, in the Indian Health Service. Uh, you also, she also had a private practice uh, and was, uh, and also worked at the public health department. Uh, and it, it says here that you also manage your father's affairs as a second career. I can see why <laughs> he himself was so prolific and active. Um, and then uh, she herself has a uh, wonderful family, husband, two sons and, and their partners and a three-year-old grandson. Uh, the uh, second participant on the panel uh, has uh, been a, a friend of Star Library for uh, quite a long time. Uh, her name is Carolyn Xu. Uh, she lives uh, both in New York and in Los Angeles. Uh, she's a designer, a philanthropist and an art collector. Uh, Carolyn graduated from Wheaton College uh, with a BA in economics, and uh, she's done multiple, talk about uh, polymath, many things as well. Uh, she launched a baby clothes company uh, called Snow Pea uh, in 1997. She has uh, also been an active uh, uh, promoter herself of Sino-American exchange, in many ways also a mediator, very similar to Lin Wang organizing seminars um, in major universities. Uh, and she actually was, it has been and continues to be very active in the China Institute. Uh, she has also been um, active in editing and publishing. She has uh, published uh, several historical biographies um, and uh, has also edited and published um, a historical and photo survey of cigarette holders as objet d'art, and also a wonderful book called Chow, Secrets of Chinese Cooking. Uh, and this uh, book actually was a winner of the 2021 Gourmand World Cookbook Award. Uh, in addition, I'm not quite sure how you get all have the time to do all of this, uh, but in addition to all of this, she has done quite a few groundbreaking exhibits of Chinese art. Uh, this includes uh, working with Xu Bing, uh, a 2011 exhibit, Shubing Tobacco Project, Virginia, uh, as well as several others. Uh, and she herself is an award-winning documentary uh, maker, uh, produce, producer of, of, of documentaries on China and Chinese art. Um, so uh, last but not least, I'd like to uh, introduce Jim, uh, one of my favorite colleagues uh, who uh, has, I, whenever I go, come to Jim's events, I always learn so much. And it's also just to celebrate his sense of initiative and enterprising um, entrepreneurism because Jim has really, since he's come here, um, kind of turned a very kind of rarefied stuffy library <laughs> into one that still has that kind of prestige, but that has just really kind of um, moved in so many multiple directions in terms of the kind of media Right, not just rare books and manuscripts any longer, but it's multimedia, it's collections, uh, it's objet d'art collection, but it's film collection, um, uh, ephemera collection has just really um, grown under his leadership. And so uh, this is a prime example of the kind of work that Jim has brought to, um, uh, he's been here already for, for several, several years, uh, but uh, sort of the contribution, why Jim has been such a wonderful leader in, in uh, our libraries here. And I just want to mention very quickly, in addition to this particular digitization project, he's also doing another one, which uh, is related to D uh, Tibetan special collection um, that um, is uh, also, it also has, you might speak a little bit to it, Jim, and I, I understand it also has film um, as well. Uh, so anyway, so all of that is to say, um, welcome, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to the three of them uh, for a roundtable. Thanks, Eugenia, and thanks to all the panelists, you know, this is a very 
uh, special journey and a special you know event for us. Yeah, so I have some you know pre you know scripted you know questions. So first, I want to ask Sue. You know, as we know, uh, you were featured in the your father's famous you know uh, Land of China series, uh, the first you know five uh, city films, in, uh, especially in the China, uh, Hangzhou, China's Garden City in 1948. Would you please share your memory and the knowledge of your father's early filmmaking career and any problems uh, with you know in the producing that film in the 1948? You know, it's a special trip you went with him. And uh, my understanding is that time is like a 1948, so the close or uh, really intense, you know, civil war time. Yes, well, my memory is not so good of those events, but uh, what happened is that my mother first went to China in 1948 in February. My father followed in June. He started by visiting, uh, he was in Beijing, Tianjin, and I think that must be when he filmed there. Then he left the areas near Shanghai for the end of his visit. And by, the, by that time, things were very chaotic. This was October, November, uh, in the fall of 48. And because of the Civil War, he was unable to film Suzhou and Moganshan, I think. Um, he does mention that he could not film Suzhou, and I can't find the Moganshan footage. And then you asked about the, the, the production. It took uh, until 1951. He had the footage in 1948, but it took till 1951 for the films to be finished. And it's actually remarkable that it happened during this time because during the end of his trip, he was preoccupied saying goodbye to his family, arranging for his adopted mother's care, packing and transporting the art objects to the United States and arranging our flight, which was not until November 17th of 1948. Um, and then once we arrived in this country, there were many changes. He, uh, both on the personal and professional front, his adopted mother died in 1949. And then soon after that, my mother's parents and sister arrived after a nine month journey on foot from Shanghai to Chongqing. And they came to live with us in our two bedroom apartment in on 152nd Street, West 152nd, which was quite a different lifestyle from what we were used to. I, I don't want to be judgmental, but it was quite different. Um, he was no longer able to run his import export business, the China Photo Supply and had to liquidate everything and he did not want to declare bankruptcy, so he had to sell all the inventory. At the same time, he had to support all of us. Oh, he was he was also applying for a change in his immigration status from treaty merchant to displaced person. And at the same time, he was trying to support all of us, all six of us. In 1949, he he, he started his new career. And he was very resourceful, just uh, unbelievable. He applied to work with the Voice of America, which was then under the US State Department. And that triggered a, a FBI inquiry, which you'll hear about later. Um, and he, he got work narrating newsreels for the US information system and translated Hollywood films. So uh, it, it's, that is in a, in a nutshell what was going on at that period. It was rather chaotic and um, I think yeah. that yeah. yeah especially I think the translation of the Hollywood film to China because this is the area you know we I think we should explore later it's a really beautiful translation to the Chinese market you know that's very special I think we are a lot of scholars must be interested and the second question is uh, can you tell us because that is a theme of this event is a you know Pacific crossings and can you tell uh, what do you know about your father's working with his partners and the collaborators, such as Su Tu Huiming and Sun Yu, uh, during his you know filmmaking uh, the career? And also, one thing is uh, what I heard is the, <coughs> the most famous Chinese feature film during the 1948. That's the Yi Jiang Chun Shui That's the uh, the, mm -hmm. the moving eastward. That was the film was uh, filmed by the equipment provided your father's film company, Chinese Photographic Equipment Supplies. Yeah. Yeah, he, he wrote some notes and said that in 1946 to 1947, when the State Department invited um, Situ Huimin and Sun Yu 
he met them, uh, as well as Lao Shi, Cao Yu, Ye Qin, Yu, and Dai Lian. And um, he, he actually hosted them and I think became quite friendly with them. And in 1946, when he founded the China Film Enterprises, Situ became the assistant manager and Sun Yu was on the board of directors. Um, the, I think that I, I, I was going to let him tell his own story um, about how when he returned to China in 1979, Sutul helped helped him with the Palace Museum book. And he was uh, a famous director of movies. Sutul, Mr. Sito. Mr. Sito came to New York, invited by the State Department. Nobody knew he was a communist underground. He was in China a famous director of movies. Then he, at that time, he's already a, 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 a communist. Mm. But State Department did not know he was a communist mm. because he's a famous director. So invited him here together was Lao Shu, the rickshaw boy writer, no, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, Ye Qian Yu, the famous painter and uh, cartoonist, and his wife, who is uh, Dai Lian, the famous dancer. Hmm. Uh, all, all six are very famous Chinese cultural people. When they got to New York, I became friends. And Mr. Sito said, you are in the movie business, I'm in the movie business. May I join your company? So I was the president of the company, he was the vice president. He knew everything I have done. The funny part is that I didn't know. Then he went back. Of course, Mao Zedong. What he became, I did not know. Then, one thing I know, FBI came to me. What is your connection with communist? I said, I don't know. What to say? You know, you know more than I do. They, ever since then, the gum shoes, two gum shoes, every time something happened in China, they came to interview me again. I was in a hotel, which is uh, not the Beijing Hotel because I couldn't get in. It's, it's so crowded. It's called Tianmen Hotel. Once I got in, the first one to visit me was Mr. Sito, 79. He came in. He's Minister of Culture. <laughs> Surprise to me, but great convenience. Very interesting. Yes. So, Sue, you have anything to add on that? Uh, and on that, I he told that story over and over again, and he told it pretty much the same way. Uh, I think, frankly, the FBI, it, it, you know, there were numerous FBI inquiries, and I think in, in some part they were triggered by the what he was doing with his work, to, to work for the Voice of America, the USIS, the Army, and so forth and so on. I don't think you can just say it's because of Sisu. <clears throat> Thanks. And uh, so I'm going to switch uh, the question to the Caroline. And I'm really uh, eternally grateful to uh, Caroline because, uh, you know, that's the Caroline introduced me to uh, Mr. Wen Go Wen in the early 2013. And when Mr. Uh, Wen's, you know, film career and his film collections were only known to very, very few people. And Caroline, so would you please describe your perspective of the value of this film, uh, by Mr. Wen Go Wen's filmmaking career and the collection? Well, uh from my point of view, you know, I've had time to think about your questions and I gave them a lot of thought. And I, this is what I've, you know, written. I feel that Wango, Mr. Wang, you know, the course of the four decades that he made films, they really reflected his love and longing for his home country, China. When I first got to know him 18 years ago, what impressed me most was the extreme passion he exhibited when he spoke about his initial foray into film. This passion coupled with his love for Chinese culture 
and history spurred him to document China and share its treasures with Western audiences. His eclectic interests are reflected in the wide ranging subject matters of his films. He documented the lives of talented Chinese men and women, life changing events, landmark historical architecture and sceneries of bygone times, as well as the pinnacle achievements of Chinese art. Mr. Wang's comprehensive overview of Chinese society and history is informed by his unique perspective as a child of a classical Chinese upbringing with a direct connection to China's dynastic past. His documentaries also benefit from his clear-eyed and audience-friendly presentation of China's turbulent and often confusing dynastic, dynastic history. His cultural documentaries also present China's 4,000-year artistic cornucopia in the same thoughtful and engaging manner. Filmmakers and storytellers will find that there is much to be learned from Mr. Wang's uncomplicated yet scholarly approach to such a vast subject as China. Uh, if there's one unifying purpose to Mr. Wang's documentary output is that in service of what he might admit was his attempt at soft diplomacy. His films are a testament to his deep affection for the culture that raised him, to the memories of an aesthetic lifestyle he carried with him when he left his homeland and which sustained him throughout his long life. Through his films, he wished to share this affection with the Western audience to foster both an understanding between cultures and an appreciation for China's unique contribution to global culture. So I think that's really what I, um, that's something that I feel I was very inspired uh, by Wango and have always felt me you know, myself, but he really, was able to, um, you know, I was able to crystallize this, you know, by knowing him. That's really great, you know, uh, Carolyn. So I really appreciate, you know, we took it together, several long van driving, you know, from New York City to New Hampshire, back and forth, you know, seven hours one way. It's really, uh, now we can see the final results come out. And I really appreciate, you know, your efforts, you know, helping Columbia to get that collection and also, Thank the one families allow us to you know donate this collection to us. And another question to Carolyn is uh, so this is again it's the uh, we're talking about Chinese film uh, Chinese American filmmaking. You know, yourself is a Chinese film uh, maker yourself. Can you say something about you know Mr. Wen's uh, influence on your own filmmaking career? Well, his Wango's documentaries really have inspired me to adopt his soft diplomacy approach in my own filmmaking practice. In the films I've produced, audiences experience Chinese culture and history at the street level through individuals, whether artists, refugees, or direct witnesses. The idea of China is given a human face and presented in the context of individual life stories. I've also tried to put in practice what I learned from Wango about clear-eyed, uncomplicated narratives even if the subject matter itself is not so simple. And finally, I've been greatly moved by Mr. Wang's unapologetic passion in the service of Chinese culture. It fueled his enthusiasm to communicate what he understood to be the essence, the internal soul of China. It's the unifying thread that runs through everything that he did. Thanks, and Carolyn. I think that sums it up. Right, thanks, Carolyn. And so, I'm going to have a final question, just a script question for every panelist, you know, just uh, say, you know, from your perspective, what's the significant value with uh, Mr. Wen's uh, legacy in the Chinese American studies and the U.S. China studies, uh, U.S. relations studies, especially in the today's situation? Just, you know, general. So that's my last question. And, uh, yeah. oh, for me? Okay. Well, I think... Wango's films were pr produced roughly over a 30 year period and they covered a very turbulent time in China's history. And the films really are a useful lens through which to view China's relationship with its most significant partner and competitor. In the 40s, when most of Wango's films were made, 
China was under Japanese occupation and an ally of America in the anti-fascist war. Later films of that period were made during the Civil War that culminated in the communist liberation of China. In the 70s, Wang Go produced the 13 film series, China, the Enduring Heritage. While his earlier films were made in support of the war effort and America's alliance with China, the later films such as A Town by the Yangtze propagated a more humanistic and intimate view of what was then communist China asking the American audience to look beyond politics of the current government and to see what we might term the eternal China. The Enduring Heritage series produced in 1976, the year that marked Mao's death and the end of the Cultural Revolution, reflected a thaw in the US-China relations. Even in the 1964 film, The Toy Maker, which while superficially not a film about China, but made it a time of rising tensions between the US and China, in the year that China tested its first atomic weapon was a plea for understanding and peace between nations and people. If nothing else, Wang Go's films are love letters to China and to Chinese culture. Proof of that enduring hold Chinese culture had on his heart and mind. That love is what moved him to share the China he knew with his adoptive country. Wang Go came to America at the age of 20, he lived here for 80 years, but as much as he loved America, he wanted America to love China as much. I would further argue that Wango's work is a testament to his belief in the power of film as a universal language to bridge cultural and political divides. It's a belief I share and which I've tried to activate through my documentaries. Thank you. Our panelists. Let me add one thing here. Um, what we can see in Mr. Wong's long, uh, amazing career is this uh, combination between both the vernacular and also the cosmopolitan, right? Uh, uh, in that kind of, uh, those two kinds of perspectives on uh, our Chinese culture. And uh, especially uh, in this age when there is uh, so much scrutiny uh, for example, uh, uh, the Confucius Institute and that approach of uh, uh, Chinese cultural diplomacy, I think uh, we can really see some different possibilities in uh, Mr. Wong's uh, long life here. Yeah, that's my uh, uh, thought. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A, um, so maybe I can read them and then, um, you know, we can respond. Um, so, so, okay, so there is a question by uh, Son uh, Hong Wei Chen. Um, so he says, thank you so much for the event. Um, so in what capacity did Wen uh, Guowen continue to work with the Harmon Foundation into the 1940s? Mm -hmm. Because from what I'm aware of, um, Harmon distributed many of his films uh, many can be found also in the National Archives and Records um, Administration. So, so yeah, so definitely I have also seen these films in National Archives. Um, so um, Chinese, um, and then uh, uh, Son also asked Chinese film educational, uh, uh, Chinese educational filmmakers such as Sun Mingjing um, have cited um, uh, Van Guowen as being one of the contacts for finding U.S. distribution for Chinese educational products. Uh, um, um, productions, uh, film productions. Um, yes, and actually the question uh, with uh, Sun Mingjing, because I've also found in my own research, um, you know, connections between Sun Mingjing and uh, Van Guoven, uh, very strong connections. Um, so yeah, so this may be a question um, for Sue or for um, Caroline, if you know um, about the Harmon Foundation and also of um, uh, Mr. Van's connection to educational film movement in China. I have to confess, I don't, I don't really remember. I, I'd have to go and read his notes if I see, I can find something. Carolyn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really don't know either. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, I guess um, uh, from what I know, um, uh, Sun Mingjing's daughter actually visited uh, uh, Van, uh, Mr. Wang um, in New Hampshire in his, um, in his residence, um, I think in the early 19, 
um, 80s or, or a bit later. I don't remember. 2013. I, I, I oh, 2013. Oh, yes. okay. I remember that. I, I was there with her. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it, it could be she would be able to tell you. I, I don't know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And no, I think education uh, cinema um, has a lot of Sino US relations. And, and Sun Min Jing is one uh, example um, because, you know, he was in the University of Nanking and also, um, uh, you know, which is a missionary college. Um, and he was, you know, the, 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 the University of Nanking um, educational cinema establishment was very much part of the educational film movement, uh, you know, it, that, that, that was also very important in the US. And so um, I found uh, in, uh, in early 19, no, I think it was late 1940s, um, uh, Sun Min Jin came to the States and uh, published uh, an article in, uh, in, the, um, in the screen, uh, I forgot which journal, um, educational screen, I think. Um, and in there you have also the then, um, you know, Sort of pictures, um, you know, illustrations provided by uh, Mr. Wen and um, his um, Chinese, his company, one of his companies. So I think that there are work uh, collaborations. Um, yeah, but I'm also not uh, sure of the details uh, other than that and then these. Yeah. Well, I hope we'll find. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Sue. No, no, I just hope we'll find something in his letters. We haven't gone through all his papers yet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I may yeah. add yeah. one yeah. thing, uh, yeah. Harman Foundation, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Wang was one of the early uh, Chinese trainees there uh, working in you know, educational film. And uh, the foundation's papers are actually at the Library of Congress. And uh, uh, when I was doing research there, I checked out the finding aids, but I couldn't locate uh, any you know, relevant uh, search words. So I didn't go into the details, but uh, if someone is interested in doing more research, maybe going beyond the descriptions in the finding aids, then that is uh, definitely a possibility there. And uh, one of the uh, 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 works by uh, Mr. Wong, I, I mentioned out of the Chinese painting brush. Yes, that one uh, was uh, sponsored through the Harman Foundation. And uh, I listed a letter from the director of the uh, foundation, uh, Mary Betty, uh, I think that's her name, uh, to Hu Shi basically in 1945, talking about this kind of collaboration with Chinese training in educational uh, uh, film. Yeah, so um, if anyone has questions, please type it into the Q&A box. Um, so there is a question from Wu Ping uh, Zhao, um, and she says, um, um, they say, um, I appreciate um, Ms. Chen, uh, Mr. Chen for showing the calligraphy of uh, the Chinese um, author Lao Shi, and wonder if there are more film documentaries of the of the author Lao Shi uh, made by uh, Mr. Wen, or any other um, documents such as correspondences could be found um, in the in the papers. Just you know. So far, I'm not aware of any documentary about Lao Shi. But I, I think uh, Sue maybe say more about uh, any Lao Shi, you know, papers related correspondence in the, uh, the uh, Sue's, you know, your father's personal papers. Well, that, that one that you showed was the only one I've seen, but, you know, he has all these folders of things, uh, which we plan to donate. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, there's another question uh, by Charles Starks. Um, I'm curious about Mr. Wen's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the working class Chinese in the US and how that evolved over time, um, as it almost um, seems as if he was doing cultural diplomacy across divisions in Chinese communities uh, in, the, in, the, in the US. Can we trace connections between a documentary like To Be Me and the Asian American civil rights movement of the period that bridged um, class divides? That's a great question. So any thoughts? I mean, I could chime in a little bit here that um, interestingly, you know, I, I referred to when my comments to the uh, changes in immigration in 1965, there were actually already was a growing number of Hong Kong immigrants in the early 1960s. Many people who left, who left China fled across the border right after the Great Leap Forward famine. 
and the U.S. started admitting them actually a little bit before 65. And my guess is that, um, you know, I, I don't know where this was filmed. People mentioned Atlantic City. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Coney Island, but there was a, uh, especially by about 68, 69, there was both, interestingly, this rise of um, this, this influx of um, people from um, Hong Kong, many with origins on the mainland, with relatives in the United States and other um, Chinese speaking areas outside of the mainland that really coincided with this growing Asian American activism that was concentrated in urban centers, especially New York and San Francisco. And interestingly that the Asian American movement was very, at least superficially in terms of its style, uh, influenced by um, by Maoism, you know, the sort of people who call themselves Red Guards and the Red Book. And I actually think it might be not necessarily a direct um, connection as much as I'd be kind of interested in seeing um, what, uh, if there's anything in the correspondence about uh, Mr. Wong's response to both the influx of new immigrants, and I like the parallels you, that others have drawn between his own experiences and in the classroom, the earlier classroom film we saw, and this young this young boy, but also, you know that that this is a regime which a lot of Chinese Americans had mixed feelings about this influx of people, the stylings of of actually, you know, working class and actually college educated Asian Americans. Um, not necessarily there being direct connections, but indirect responses to trying to grapple with, you know, at the time that this film was made, this is the very beginning in which the U.S. government is starting to move towards an opening with Richard Nixon eventually making that trip. This is the very early 70s, right? So there were in a lot of Chinese American communities, there is this move towards being able to push away as well among not just sort of activists, but ordinary people interested in their heritage, being able to move away and openly say, I'm not sharing a political viewpoint, but I want to know. This is the first time I've seen what China looks like. Or, I, you know, I, and there was also a lot of conflict between the older working class people and the influx of people from Hong Kong, where there were, you know, there were some issues. So there's a lot of complexity. I think that would be an interesting, interesting issue to follow and learn more about, but I'm not sure we could say there's this direct influence because there's, it's very complicated. If I may add uh, one thing here, and uh, uh, I actually wonder whether Mr. Wong's uh, film on that uh, Chinese American boy, right, coming from uh, Hong Kong that was made in the 70s, whether that's a coincidence or actually that uh, actually reflected the uh, changing orientation of actually the China uh, Institute. Uh, in the 1970s, because according to my oral history interview with uh, the director of the China Institute in the 1970s, which was not Mr. Wong, but uh, his basically predecessor, that was the decade when the China Institute began to pay way more attention to, uh, 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 a lot more attention uh, to the Chinese American community and actually receiving federal grant through the Bilingual Education Act. And uh, to give you another uh, contrast here, uh, one document I have found from uh, 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 the China Institute uh, related materials in the mid fifties, when they were doing fundraising, they were still talking about a uh, Chinese American community in a very dismissive way. Uh, I found this phrase, we don't want money from those Cantonese laundry men. We want to go after the big, right, prominent Chinese, not those yeah, uh, uh, not so prominent Chinese, basically. So you see the uh, you see the orient uh, changing trans uh, uh, orientation uh, uh, from the fifties into the seventies. Yeah, I think uh, there's one thing very interesting to me is, uh, you know, when Charlotte's talking about this uh, working class and elite, you know, Chinese Americans, and uh, when when the film is striking me, it's very interesting. Is uh, when it goes, you know, collection. It's not he did not direct direct that movie. So it's called China Kitchen. So the movie is uh, uh, featured in you know, a Chinatown, featured in you know, the Cantonese, you know, the, 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 the barbecue chickens, uh, you know, ducks and the grocery stores, and even pick up some Chinese restaurant. But interesting thing is that the main thing is not talking about cooking behind the just uh, kitchens in the Chinese restaurant, but main things feature this one very sophisticated, sophisticated you know, Chinese lady, Nancy Wang, I believe. She was also teaching the time, teaching cooking Chinese cuisine in the China Institute. 
And you can see she's very sophisticated, very from well family and the cooking is the art for her. So she cook, then she have special manner to eat you know, dinner, finish it with her husband. And so this is a, something you can see, you know, it's like, a, I'm not I'm just saying she's, when it goes from the very sophisticated, you know, the elite, you know, the families. So even featured, I think, and I, I, I try to looking for if there's any documentary about, you know, laundry mats, even the, you know, the kitchens behind the Chinese restaurant, but no, no but this special movie is about Chinese kitchen about the Chinatown, but the feature, the major thing is she's a very sophisticated Chinese lady. And, and Carolyn, maybe you can say something, she published a book about, you know, Chinese recipe, you know, that time also by a very famous Chinese lady in the, in China. In the, in China. Okay, I've, uh, can you can hear me now? Well, this all goes back to what we call soft diplomacy. And um, well, uh, that time they felt what is a bridge between East and West? And, you know, food is an international language. And that's something that also because for Chinese, um, Confucius dictates everything, how to do everything, including how to eat, your table etiquette, and as well as how to prepare food. So to share Chinese culture, you have to share our Confucian thought. And taking food is a, it's a more, it's a easier, it's a, it's easier to understand. And it's a social lubricant. And that's something. And then when we go back to China Institute, you know, originally, as we know, uh, in 26, when he was founded, it was really as a support for the Chinese students studying in America. You know, they really kept track of every student, where they were from in China, what um, they were doing, what they were studying in America, and when they returned. And then after 40, and that kept going on until after 49, when there were over 6,000 students basically stranded in America. And, you know, as time went on, it really looked like there was no hope to go back, except for the few hundred who insisted to return home. Uh, the rest of them needed to find jobs and they really needed to acclimate into American society. And that's when Dr. Meng really started to actively you know, that's when China's to really actively began to think about how to help people acclimate. So there were the training programs, the co-op training programs with American companies, career counseling. Uh, he converted the, where the Chinese garden is um, at the, uh, in the old house, in the old building, there was a library in the ground floor, the basement floor of the townhouse leading into a garden. And he thought, well, you know, there might, be people who will, might need to also open a restaurant. So we have to teach the cooking is a skill we can teach them. And, and they turned this whole downstairs into a big kitchen with cooking lessons. And so basically, you know, China Institute really reinvented itself, you know, to suit the times. That's great, Carolyn. Um, there, oh yeah, uh, Yintiu, do you want to? comment? Okay, yeah, if I may add uh, one more thing about the uh, uh, featured uh, instructor in that uh, uh, film, Our Chinese uh, Kitchen, and that's uh, Florence Ling, and uh, she was from Zhejiang and coming to uh, the U.S. in the late 40s as a new wave of uh, uh, Chinese arriving in the U.S. and uh, as a Chinese woman, educated Chinese woman, uh, needing to find her niche in the post-war American society and uh, introducing uh, Chinese food beyond chop suey uh, to the American audience. And uh, another interesting uh, uh, source related to uh, uh, Florence Ling is roughly at the same time in the late 60s, I have found this article from the uh, 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 women's magazine Cosmopolitan. And uh, there is this one article on uh, uh, different things you can do when you are really bored in New York City. And uh, the editor suggested going to take uh, Mrs. Ling's uh, 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 Chinese cooking uh, 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 lessons because you will really find a new self. That's great. Um, so uh, maybe just the last question. Um, you know, we have we have more questions, but we are running out of time. Um, so uh, Iman Wang uh, 
asked. So um, she's curious to know if one's films uh, were shown on the US television. Um, that, yeah, that's also something I'm interested in, um, you know, whether educational films of this lens um, get screened and get uh, broadcasted. Yeah. Sue, did you know anything? About I vaguely that? remember something, and I would have to look it up. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't remember exactly what it mm. was. There, there was so, something I, I, I could look it up and email, email you. I, my understanding: there's some films now in the, uh, 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 the, the internet archive. The internet archive. There's something open to the, uh, to some educational films open to the public. And what we have now, it's not open to the public you know, yet because of the, of the copyright issues. But we did it uh, with family uh, agreements. We did uh, send some films to the uh, Shanghai Film and uh, Audio and uh, Visual Archives. They did, you know, city viewings without, you know, it's nonprofit academic shootings in the China, Shanghai. We know Shanghai, Hangzhou and Nanjing. And also we give some films for the uh, MFA in Boston. So Boston gonna have a special, uh, you know, uh, Van Gogh wins the shows with the films. I think it's in May. Um, okay, I think we are, um running we're we're running out of almost close to nine o'clock so um and it's a long session um especially on zoom so i want to thank everybody for um, participating and especially for our panelists for such wonderful um you know wonderful uh, discussions and and journeys through um, um Mr. One's work. And so this will be only the beginning of the conversation and we hope to do more. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. My thank father you. would have been very happy. Thank you.